Hello and welcome to today's webinar, which is on how to avoid and resolve disputes under the NEC Forms of Contract. Presented today is myself, I'm Ian Heafy, I'm a member of the NEC4 Contract Board and a director at In Construction Consulting. My co-host today is Marcus Birch. I'm a construction dispute specialist, I do litigation, arbitration and adjudication. In terms of the agenda for today in the webinar, we're going to look at dispute avoidance in NEC4 the previous process to try and avoid disputes before they occur. Then we're going to touch on the final assessment process and we'll use the ECC, the Engineering and Construction Contract, as an example for that. Then we'll look at the dispute resolution procedures, W1, W2 and the new W3, which again is relevant to the ECC. And then finally, we'll give an overview of the dispute resolution service contract. And then there'll be time for Q&A at the end. And in fairness, you should have access now to a uh, screen that allows you to submit questions for the webinar. So feel free to submit questions at any time. If they're particularly pertinent to what we're discussing, we'll pick them up at the time, or if not, we'll leave them to the end. Well, I'll ask the first question if I may, Ian. Um, this is all about disputes today. Uh, why are we talking about disputes under NEC? Uh, spirit of mutual trust and cooperation. Um, what's the, what's the, why the focus on disputes? Well, I think you know, it is fair to say that we do try to avoid disputes occurring or at least reduce their effect if they do happen under the NEC forms of contract. And there's a number of procedures built into the contract itself to try to, to mitigate or avoid disputes. Perhaps the most important one is clause 10.2, as it is in NEC 4 now, which is the requirement of the parties to act in a spirit of mutual trust and cooperation. So there's a requirement here for the parties to be, if you like, fair and reasonable, to try and work together, to reduce or mitigate the effect of events that could turn into disputes or to be perhaps more reasonable in trying to agree how those disputes are dealt with and resolved, albeit they're always governed by the actual rules of the contract. They have to comply with what the contract says. Another big thing we have in the contract is early warnings. Early warnings is a proactive risk identification and mitigation tool. The idea being that either party can raise an early warning of a event which they think will affect time, cost or quality. And that's regardless of who's liable, who's responsible, whether it will or will not become a compensation event. The idea being that regardless of cause or liability, you raise the issue, you deal with it um, as quickly as possible in a way that brings advantage to all those affected. So there's less likely to be you know, a cost or delay flowing from it that could then become the source of a dispute. So trying to head off issues before they balloon into issues that can become problems. Programme, another very important part of any NEC contract, very much at the heart of the contracts. And we have this concept of the accepted programme, and that should be used to do, to do two things, especially to manage the works. So looking at interfaces between this contract and other contracts, agreeing when the client or others will do certain activities. So the parties have clarity over when they have to do things, what they've committed to do and by when. So that should mean there's less problems, there's less issues that flow from that. People know what they're meant to do and therefore they can hopefully deliver to that. That's less likely to cause delays and problems. And also the accepted programme is used to manage change and really linking with the final point on the slide compensation events. We have a process in the contract to try and work out the time and cost effects of change as and when it occurs, hopefully ahead of it occurring where possible on a prospective basis. And this is trying to encourage the parties to use this up-to-date accepted programme to impact delay events, to look at the effect on defined cost plus fee. So what the cost really will be to the contractor for the change. So the contractor will be compensated for the event because it's not their risk under the contract. They should recover a fair entitlement in accordance with the provisions of the contract. And that, again, should remove the potential for claims. We don't have gamesmanship around bill rates being used or rates in a tender that could be seen to maybe be disproportionately high or low. The idea is we're compensating the contractor. And I think that's most importantly of all, we have some very clear timescales for that process and ways of either party to drive the compensation process to a conclusion. So that allows the parties to, you know, hopefully uh, agree things as and when they occur or at least a decision is taken as and when things occur that is closed out finalized and we move on 
rather than let it drift, fester, and become a much bigger issue. So that's right. I mean, so uh, the dispute avoidance part is a very big part because I mean, most of these, these disputes they just go away. Those mechanisms are there, the compensation event mechanism particularly, to make the disputes go away. Um, but let's not be naive. I mean, there are disputes that happen irrespective of those mechanisms, and um, you know, things go wrong, as we all know. Um, you know. The first problem that occurs, really, is that unexpected things happen, uh, ground condition problems, weather problems, um, third-party interventions. These can lead to increased costs and delay, uh, which usually bears on the contractor in the first instance. Um, but there's usually going to be uh, some sort of discussion, or which can lead to a dispute, about who, who ultimately carries it, whether it's the contractor or, or the employer. Um, and of course, when you're talking about a dispute, the first place one goes uh, really is the contract as uh, the primary mechanism of dealing with your, uh, with your dispute. Um, uh, and the NEC is founded on the basic concept that the contract's a commercial bargain. And uh, as recognized in English law and uh, most of the systems of law around the world, uh, the, the idea of the contract is to allocate risk. The, you know, there are risk events, things will occur, um, and we must allocate risk. Uh, and the parties have already done that. In, in their contract. And so we don't just have 10.2. It's not as if the parties are just asking, acting in a spirit of cooperation. There's also the rule in 10.1 that uh, the parties, the PM and the supervisor, all have to act in accordance with the contract. And so that's, that's the, the primary approach to dealing with disputes, is that the parties are obliged to, to act in accordance uh, with their contract. Yeah, and I think that's a really important point to make, that we do have this idea 10.1, that is the prime obligation in the contract. The parties have to do what the contract says. As you've already uh, stated there, the contract is this commercial bargain that the parties have signed up to. There is an allocation of risk. And so certain events will occur for which the contractor may be compensated and some for which they won't be compensated. So there may be times when a party has to pay out money or does not receive money. And that can leave a sour taste. You know, it can cause ill feeling, but ultimately you have to operate the contract as written you can't just ignore that commercial bargain, the rules of the contract, and just, you know, try to agree everything. You have to operate the contract as written, but not forgetting 10.2 in the right spirit, that spirit of mutual trust and cooperation. And that's right. And in most cases, so in most cases, the disputes go away because of the avoidance mechanisms. There's another large category of disputes that will go away simply because the contract deals with it. It's quite clear who's responsible for that or, or for that. And, and really... What you're dealing with after that is, is a rump of disputes where uh, it, it isn't avoided and the parties can't agree on the words. Um, there are frequently, I'm just talking about disputes we've had uh, recently under the NEC um, suite, parties can disagree about the, the meaning of the words in the contract. Um, that, that doesn't happen uh, so much with the standard terms, but what does happen is that uh, parties will often have Z clauses, uh, bespoke clauses that they like to have in there. Um, uh, and those Z clauses might be well drafted in themselves uh, and might work well in other contracts, but they might not fit well with the mechanisms of how standard NEC works, particularly in relation to uh, assessment of events and allocation of risks. Um, another problem you have um, is that there's different sections of the contract. You have the main conditions at the front end, the contract data, which has the, the employer's part and the contractor's part, and then you have the scope, which under NEC 3 was, was works information. And um, we've seen cases where there's language in those three parts which don't fit together very well. That can lead to disputes. Um, and the final example we've, we've cited there is defining the work. When people divide work into sectional completions, uh, it's in the options X5 and X7, um, th there's frequently a discussion about precisely what work uh, was, in, was in what section. Um, disagreements also about the assessment of compensation events. This isn't, a, this isn't really a legal uh, point purely, um, it, it's about you know what is this compensation event worth, particularly uh, prolongation cost claims, uh, quantity surveyors uh, need to come in, assess the delay, um, see what the run rate uh, of, of cost is, and uh, there will be disagreement about that, it's a technical dispute. Uh, and finally, uh, you know, the reasons for disputes that we see is, is people failing to operate the contract mechanisms. Um, NEC is particularly dependent on uh, applying the, the correct level of a commercial management resource during the running of the contract, during the construction phase, to update the program, which is a key dispute avoidance mechanism, and doing assessment of compensation events as they happen uh, before um, other things have changed 
so that you can isolate the effects and people don't do that. And there is a problem of, of, of leaving things uh, to, to later. There's a problem of not assessing and of, of not therefore getting any, getting any agreement as to who's assumed the risk of a particular event on, until later in the piece. Um, but uh, we, we've introduced some, uh, some changes to the suite, I think, here now um, to, 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 to speed up that process and to oblige parties to get that final resolution. Yeah, that's right. Within an EC4, we've brought in a couple of provisions to deal with final assessments. Um, the idea being, as you've outlined already, that you know the processes in the contract should lead people to agree things as and when, that there are processes to follow to close out compensation events, etc. However, we still saw in NEC3 issues where things weren't being closed out, people were agreeing to disagree, and then things would drift on for a considerable period of time and then other in events would impact upon it and things weren't being closed out. So the first thing we've introduced is a way of agreeing defined cost on a rolling basis. So this applies in the cost reimbursable options, C, D, E, F, where payment is made based on defined cost plus fee. And the process covers under clause 50.9, how the contractor can propose that elements of defined cost are signed off, are closed out and agreed. So the idea is the contractor decides when that element of defined cost is ready for submission. Ultimately, it's their records. They have to be um, comfortable that they have all the invoices in. They've settled any disputes with suppliers or subcontractors so they can definitively state what that element of defined cost is. They put that forward to the project manager, make the data available for the project manager to review. So we're not expecting here for the contractor to submit boxes and boxes of files, rather make them available, possibly electronically, for the project manager to inspect. The project manager has a 13-week period in which to respect, uh, sorry, inspect those records. That's a maximum period. They can do it quicker than great. On the back of that, the project manager either accepts it or requests for more information if there's a lack of detail in certain areas or asks for things to be corrected if the project manager believes them to be wrong. The contractor then resubmits within four weeks and the project manager has a further four weeks once those amended revised records are provided and again the process either to accept it or issue a correction to it so the project manager doesn't have to accept it they can say this bit's okay but this bit is wrong because and, and change it but the idea being that through this process you do have in effect a closed out element of defined cost not sort of to be reopened and it just means that as you progress through the project, you can close out the fine cost. So at the end, you know, there's very little work to do to get the final amount of defined cost plus fee agreed. And so that must take the pressure off the final assessment process if you've already agreed on the defined cost as you go along. Absolutely. And I think also it will hopefully give more security and comfort to both parties over what that defined cost is. And that there isn't a risk that you're going to get a lot of um, disallow costs if you're the contractor at the end of the project suddenly being taken out when you didn't anticipate them and also that when you've closed out an element of accounts for an, an element of work or for a period of time the contractor then can't come back against that so you know you've got to be careful about exactly uh, how you stipulate what's being agreed and what the coverage is of those defined cost records but the idea is once they've been closed out they are fixed they are final and so, as you say, quite rightly, there's less to agree at the very you, end. But then you still do need a final assessment process in some in some projects. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and I think this was an issue that you know, did come through within any C3 feedback, that there wasn't a way within the contract to actually conclusively close out the financial, the final financial arrangements between the parties, to actually close out the defined cost plus fee, so it could never be reopened, to close out the total of the prices, yeah. so that someone couldn't then try and claim retrospective compensation events. Um, and obviously there are provisions trying to stop that anyway, but there was still a risk around this. So in NEC4, we brought in clause 53, which has a requirement for the project manager in the first instance to make a final assessment um, within four weeks of the issue of the defect certificate, which would normally be 12 months after the works themselves are complete or 13 weeks after a termination certificate, if that's what's occurred on the project. So the project manager has this duty to issue this, this assessment, but if they don't, then the contractor can do the assessment. Whoever does it has to give details of how they've made the assessment. And the, if the parties agree to the assessment made, again, by either party, the payment is made, 
normally that'll be from the client to the contractor, but it could be from the contractor to the client if there's delay damages or something else that is now making it into a, a negative payment. So it's quite a structured process. Project manager is in the lead, but if they fail to do their function, maybe they're no longer engaged by the client and they're not involved, the contractor can do it. But the key thing is when either party issues that, the other party has to say whether they agree or disagree with it, or rather, if they don't disagree with it, the final assessment is taken as conclusive evidence of the final match due under the right, contract. So it's the same. It's the same principle as in our, our UK Construction Act, where uh, on a, on a monthly payment notice basis, if uh, uh, the if the if the contractor issues his payment application and the PM doesn't reply, then that contractor's payment application is taken as the payment for that month. Is the due payment. so? It's effectively it's applying that, but in the final assessment context. Yeah. So the idea is, it's trying to get quite a simplistic process, but it is creating this mechanism of, you know, of forcing the parties to either yeah. formally disagree or either formally agree with this. If they're silent, that's then going to be agreement after the end of the time scales in the contract. Uh, I think someone's just raised a question there around, does the contract have to remind the project manager they failed to issue the final assessment? Uh, and, and the answer is no. The process is project manager has a duty to issue it. If they don't, the contractor can issue it. Back to 10.2 then, mutual trust cooperation. There's nothing stopping the contractor saying it's been four weeks or we're coming up to the four week stage. Have you done it project manager? And there's nothing stopping, again, looking to work together to, to do that. But if the PM doesn't do it, the contractor can issue it. Um, but whoever issues it, the other party can raise an objection to it. But they have to raise that formally and they have to then start one of the dispute resolution processes under the contract. Right. So it's not just, it's not just a, a, a pay less notice or a pay more notice, depending on which side you're on. It, it's, a, it's a formal dispute at that point. Yeah. The idea being that we don't want things to drift and people either be to be silent or agree to disagree. It's, you know, almost railroading the parties into if you don't agree, you have to formally disagree, launch a dispute resolution process. And that way we are now into a mechanism with set timescales to get to a final conclusion because the way it works is you do each stage of the dispute process and you have to move into the next one within a set time scale so for example in w1 the senior representatives uh, will meet and try and decide the issue if they fail to achieve a decision on that you would have to launch the matter or take the matter to adjudication if you disagreed with anything they agreed or did not agree to at the end of the adjudication, if a party is unhappy with what the adjudicators decided, again, they would then have to launch an action with the tribunal within a four week period. Yeah. And that, that four week period might look might look narrow, um, but, but I think overall it isn't. I mean, it's not as if within that four weeks, one has to present all of one's evidence and one's case and one's delay analysis and one's technical experts, etc. I mean, to refer to a tribunal, we'll get on to the different types of, of tribunal later on, but uh, simplistically, Either you have to put a claim form before the court, and that's a two-page document, or you have to commence an arbitration, and that can be a very uh, simple uh, document. So the four weeks um, has no particular magic to it, as I understand, um, but it is it is going to be long enough to raise a formal dispute. Yeah, and obviously, your know, two parties to a contract can agree to you know various things. So they could always agree to extend that period. Perhaps if there was going to be some further negotiations, perhaps the adjudicator has decided some substantive issues. There's a few minor issues left. Well, actually, maybe they could agree to hold on going to the tribunal, you know, mutually agree to have an extended period to try and settle those outstanding issues before launching into that process. Mm -hmm. This is really to deal with where one party is not engaging, is not providing a response, and the other party can force it through to a conclusion, which is similar to the vast majority of the procedures in the standard contract, the ability of a party to drive things to a conclusion if the other party does not engage. We see in compensation events, program acceptance now. Uh, a couple of other questions have, have come in from people on the webinar. Um, this process in terms of the final assessment clause 53, that applies to all of the main options. And we have similar versions of this in all of the contracts. So all contracts in the NEC suite or all the main contracts have this uh, final assessment process and it covers across all main options. Okay. 
I think I think probably good good now to work on to the the dispute resolution options because we've got W1, W2, and W3, and 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 effectively those are a sort of NEC code for different. Um, they're not different types of dispute resolutions in themselves. They're they're different mixes of dispute resolution styles, and we'll we'll, we'll explain that. The, the first the first thing to think about is is what is going to be my choice of option. Um, it's um, as a matter of principle, uh, it's entered by the client. Uh, first part of the contract data is provided by the client, the employer, um, and it's and it's that choice. I mean, of course, it can be negotiated if the contractor has any sort of leverage in that respect. Uh, frequently, clients that are doing large projects like to have a, a single option with all of the contractors, so they know what they're doing. So it's frequently just imposed, uh, for want of a better word, um, by the client in contract data part one. Um, now, the reason why there are, there are several choices is simple, that different projects have different requirements, um, but, but also, uh, you know, one has to have regard to the, the prevailing uh, legislation. Um, here in the UK, we have the Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act uh, that we typically just call the Construction Act. Um, and that, that requires for all construction operations uh, contracts in the UK that adjudication must be available. Uh, and so a specific provision has to be made uh, for those. And that's, and that's the W2 uh, has to be used um, if your construction operations in the UK, because adjudication is available in, in W2. Um, the others, W1 and, and W3 can be used if you're either in the UK, but not doing construction operations, or if you're around the world and you're not bound uh, by the, the Construction Act. Um, to simplify, um, and we'll go through them in more detail, W1, W2, the main way of resolving the dispute is adjudication. Um, and in W3, uh, there's a relatively new option there, it's to use a dispute avoidance board. Okay, so, so just to sorry, recap on that, Marcus, we have a choice of three options in the ECC. I think it's worth pointing out that W3 only appears in the ECC contract. It's not in the PSC, the TSC, the supply contract. Um, and so we have these three options, uh, as you already outlined, in the UK, if the work you're doing is governed by the Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act, you don't have a choice, really. You have to pick W2 because that is the only option of the three that is compliant with that piece of legislation. If you're operating outside of the UK or undertaking work in the UK not covered by the Act, you have a choice of W1 or W3. You could still use W2, but actually W1 and W2 are very similar and the reason why we have W2 is actually to meet the requirements of the Act. And if you were working outside of the Act's jurisdiction, the, uh, the board of the NEC would recommend selecting W1. The, fe the feeling is that's a, a better process. It has a reference table for taking matters to dispute. It has slightly simplified processes. So the view being that that is a better adjudication process than W2 but we need to have W2 to comply with the Act. So overseas, outside of the Act's provisions, W1 or W3, if you want adjudication W1, W3 we'll talk about in a bit more detail shortly. So Mark, back to W1 and W2. Yes, back to W1. Um, and there's been a question that's come in about uh, the, the senior representatives uh, element. I mean, this um, mode of dispute resolution will be familiar to those uh, using sort of tiered arbitration clauses and the like that are increasingly common. Uh, the, the first stage of a dispute uh, resolution is to result, re, is to refer it to the senior representatives. Now, uh, under W1, it's, it's mandatory, and as Ian was saying, um, that's the preferred option. Uh, or, or under W2, it's, it's by agreement. Um, senior representatives, to answer the question, I mean, they, they need to be people who, who are senior, in the sense that they are removed from sight, they are removed from the day-to-day uh, operation of the contract, so not just from the works, but also from the commercial negotiations. Um, the idea is that you have someone who's sufficiently senior and sufficiently separate uh, to take to take a cooler view, uh, who is not affected by discussions that may have been uh, going on for months, uh, people taking particular op opinions, entrenched views, um, people possibly invested in them. Yeah. We need somebody at uh, not necessarily a board level, but um, at a senior level who, who can take a step back and see what is the dispute worth financially, uh, what is it worth in terms of the progress of the project, and, and what's most important here. And hopefully if you get one from each side that's got that perspective, 
It doesn't have to be someone technically qualified. It just has to have somebody with the gravitas, with the seniority um, that can, can make a decision, can bring his side uh, with him and can make a decision. Uh, effectively, if you were, it, a good analogy is if you were going to mediation and you wanted to send somebody along um, to, to make the decision as to whether to mediate or to settle at a particular level, it'd be that sort of, be that sort of figure. Um, the process that's put in place here reflects uh, the sort of people that uh, the drafters had in mind. Uh, it's, a it's a very short statement of case, you know, 10 pages, you know, executive length uh, with some supporting evidence. Parties can always agree uh, longer, uh, but typically these things work best if it's, if it's done on, on a limited amount of paper. It's an informal process. The parties can agree how it works. Um, the senior representatives can ask for uh, an expert to assist them, they, they can ask for a mediation to help work through issues. There's no limits really to it, um, but there is a time limit to it because, uh, because of, the, of the dynamic of trying to bring people to a resolution to oblige them to act, to, to resolve their disputes. Uh, yeah, I think it's a key thing, you know, there is a time that we don't want to turn it into a, a talking shop where people spend weeks, months, you know, extended periods of time talking but not getting anywhere. So there is a time period. Again, that can be extended by mutual agreements but it can't be used as a delaying tactic by one side. Um, and in terms of the process, as you said, it can be very informal. Um, we've deliberately not within the contract specified how it should work because this was really going to be a, a consensual dispute resolution process whereby the parties are looking to do a commercial deal in effect. They're looking to agree, can they come to a compromise or can they both agree a particular interpretation to resolve the dispute? You know, if it's got to this stage, it's probably going to be an issue that isn't clear cut. And therefore, there may be some way of compromising or coming up with some sort of deal that will satisfy both parties. And this enables the parties to do that using whatever form they think is going to help them to achieve uh, the right result in the end. That's right. And, and if you can't get agreement uh, at senior representative level, then uh, W1 and W2 envisage uh, that you go off to an adjudicator. Um, now, an adjudicator is an independent third party, uh, completely independent uh, of the parties. Uh, there are a few options in relation to identifying an adjudicator, uh, and we would recommend everyone give very careful thought uh, to this. Um, the first is to uh, name them in the contract, um, either an individual or sometimes it's useful to, to mention a, a panel uh, of people who are can potentially be adjudicators to deal with availability issues so on. Um, th that can have drawbacks as to availability, etc. Um, or indeed, it may be impossible to agree at the outset of the contract. Um, a very widespread method as an alternative is, is to agree an appointing authority, uh, be it the ICE or the RICS, uh, several appointing authorities that will have a panel of, of qualified individuals uh, with, the, with the requisite skills. Um, uh, it's, it's under the NEC suite, uh, it's now possible to appoint an adjudicator under the Dispute Resolution Service contract. Uh, that's, we, we'll get on to that, but it's appointment terms, and so that deals with the, the terms of appointment. Uh, and um, it, it is possible to join in uh, your, your subcontract uh, disputes as well, um, simply by a matter of agreement. Uh, so that, that's not something that should be done lightly uh, because it, it creates a much more complex dispute which might not be suitable for adjudication, but it's something that's possible by agreement. Okay, so yeah, coming back to that idea in terms of who should be an adjudicator, I think you know, there's no specific requirement in the contract as, as to any particular skill set of that person. The contract simply allows the client in contract data part one to name an adjudicator. So that could be someone who obviously they believe has the skills to act in that capacity. You mentioned that, you know, you also have to include as well as if you name someone or even if you, sorry, if you don't or even if you do name somebody in the contract data, you still have to put in a nominating body because there's a, a chance if you do name somebody that they may not be available when the dispute arises. There's very tight timescales for adjudications in which they take place. If that person can't act immediately, you would need to find an alternative, hence the need to include a nominating body. And they say some people do actually just leave it blank and have just a nominating body because, again, there may be a perception if the client names a person, will they be truly an independent third party or do they have some existing relationship with the client? That's right. And a nominating body can, uh, in the right kind of case, look at the notice of adjudication, see what sort of a dispute is uh, and find someone that's got suitable suitable skills for that. So that, that gives a wider range 
uh, of possibilities. Yeah, and I guess the only downside to that, of course, is the parties are then putting their trust in that nominating body, finding a suitable person. Yeah. Whereas if they can both agree mutually to somebody, that's going to be even better because they'll have somebody who they are both happy with and they both believe has the ability to act as the adjudicator. Now, now, just about the powers of the adjudicator, they're very broad. Um, the adjudicator can review or revise any action or inaction of the PM or the supervisor uh, and can, can hear the dispute, uh, find the facts, uh, hear the law, uh, really in any way that he or she considers appropriate. Uh, Document production or disclosure, as we call it here, uh, is not very normal in adjudication processes. However, an adjudicator can instruct a party to provide further information. It's, um, it's a classic inquisitorial process where the adjudicator has a range of powers to ask for anything he or she would, would require. Um, and the parties have agreed to, to cooperate with it and, and should do so. Um, what, one of the more difficult aspects of adjudication procedure is the timescales. Um, uh, as a matter of the, the Act here, um, there's limited time to make the decision, and that's typically 28 days from the referral. Um, now, that can be extended uh, with the consent of one or both parties, um, and it often is extended, but equally there are many cases in which they are heard in 28 days. Um, that that uh, is one of the, the the most significant criticisms of adjudication as a process in that some of the disputes uh, sent off to adjudication really can't be resolved um, entirely within 28 days. Uh, you can think, for example, complex extension of time claims or uh, defects claims or you know, a large package of variations. These sorts of claims are very difficult to do in 28 days. Um, so, so, so could the adjudicator say, I can't deal with this, um, so therefore um, I, I don't have to give a decision, or do they have to give a decision? Is that the nature of the process? No, it's, it's actually open to the adjudicator who say, I, I cannot deal with this within 28 days, and therefore I, I'm recusing myself and I won't hear it. Well, then it'd be a case of having to put another adjudicator exactly. to go through that process again. So ultimately, even with a complex or large dispute, you'd have to go through and get to an end of that you process. Would, you, you would, and eventually you would find an adjudicator who would willing to take it on. OK, and I guess the issue of that then, coming back to they have a limited timescale, is there a, a, an issue about rough justice here? Could, you know, a decision be uh, rushed or forced that maybe doesn't c cover all the facts or all the debates and arguments right. could be put forward? Uh, and it does happen, and we shouldn't be too embarrassed about um, admitting that it does happen. It was always expected that that would happen with these more complex cases. Um, adjudicators are forced in those cases to take shortcuts to um, you know, to take a variations example, to do, take a sample. I'm just going to look at the top 10. Uh, and on the basis of my decision of those, I'm going to apply that pro rata through the rest. Uh, that's extremely rough justice. Um, to take extension of time decisions purely on the basis of, of the programmes with very little investigation of, of what actually happened, th th that's the way it is. But I mean, you know, the, the core of what happens with an adjudication decision is it's binding, uh, but it's not final. The, the ultimate um, saving for the procedure for these over complex cases is that if one party isn't happy with the decision, it can be referred up uh, to the tribunal for a, for a decision which would be final. Okay, so decision to say it's binding but not final. When you say it's binding, and it's binding as a contractual obligation, um, so similar, I guess, to um, possibly in the course of the dispute, which was someone disagreeing with a contractually binding decision that they disagree with, such as a, uh, a project manager assessment of a compensation event. So how would somebody enforce or get a party to comply with the decision of an adjudicator. Well, that's right. You know, on, on a very basic level, you start with a, a contractual claim. And then once you've got an adjudication decision, you have a contractual claim. So you're right in saying that, you know, conceptually, it doesn't advance the party much. Now, what, what uh, you know, the law has recognised this and how we take that forward is that uh, the statutory support for the rapid and no questions asked enforcement uh, of adjudication decisions. Now, this starts in the UK with our Act, the full title is now up there, um, which, which makes provision for uh, summary enforcement of adjudication decisions in the technology and construction courts uh, here, here in the UK. That's a, a fast track procedure can be done within a month. And uh, crucially, the, the courts won't go back to the merits of the dispute. They will take the decision, say this is a decision, this point has been decided by the adjudicator and, and we'll enforce it um, unless there's a lack of jurisdiction, whether he's gone ultra virus beyond his powers, uh, or there's been a, a lack of due process or bias or something serious uh, of that nature. 
Um, that's that's the model. Um, in Australia also, that's on a state-by-state -state basis in Australia, where they have similar legislation to enforce adjudication decisions. Uh, we've cited Singapore as well. Um, Hong Kong, it isn't there yet. Uh, there's, there's a process in place uh, to enact that legislation. It has taken some time as the, the local legislature decides between the different models of legislation, but we're hoping that soon there will be legislation in place so that in Hong Kong you can get a fast track uh, enforcement in the courts and therefore convert your adjudication decision into a court judgment very quickly. Okay, so I guess what we're saying is that in these particular locations, statutory support enables a party who is successful in adjudication to get that decision uh, complied with very quickly uh, with that court support. Uh, in those locations where you don't have that, then it becomes a matter of contractual obligation. I think some courts in certain countries may also give quite a lot of credence to that decision and may well enforce it fairly rapidly. Um, but ultimately, it is a, it's still going to be a contractual obligation that the parties should comply with in accordance with Clause 10.1. Yes, absolutely. So even in the countries where there isn't a straightforward enforcement in that way, a lot of countries will 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 be influenced by it and will and will enforce it uh, as a contractual obligation. Again, and again, back guess that ultimate thing of it is um, binding but not final. So there's always a right of taking it to a further tribunal. Absolutely. Okay, so we've touched on W1 and W2 there. I think W3 is uh, one we need to talk about as well. Um, I've already mentioned that W3 is specific to the ECC. And the idea behind this is to create a board that tries to work with the parties to resolve disputes either, you know, well, hopefully ahead of them happening. So actually being proactive, being engaged with the parties to anticipate disputes before they occur, or if things start to become um, disagreements between the parties, helping them resolve it. So the members of the dispute board are appointed at the start of the project, they visit site, they're involved, they get to know what's going on on the project, so they can take on this proactive function. The dispute avoidance board can either be one person or three people, if it's a single person, that person is appointed by the client. If it's three people, the client and the contractor appoint a person each, and they jointly agree a third person. And the key thing in terms of who is appointed as members of the DAB, it's people with the, sort of the gravitas or the seniority, the respect of the parties, that the parties are going to listen to their opinions and take on board what they suggest. So I think careful selection will be important to, to make this process work effectively. And one of the key things to understand here is that the Dispute Avoidance Board makes recommendations. They do not make binding decisions. So it's up to the parties to decide whether or not they will agree with that recommendation and put it into practice. They do not have to. And why, why would we have a, a, a dispute resolution mechanism that, that, that doesn't create a binding outcome? What, what, what would be the purpose of that? Okay, well, if the parties do want a binding decision, then they can pick W1 and they can have adjudication and they can have a contractually binding decision made by a third party, independent of the parties, as we've described already. The idea of the Dispute Avoidance Board is this idea that it's a much more consensual process whereby the parties are saying, let's bring in this third party to help us try to resolve and, and diffuse disputes, almost acting in a, as a quasi-mediator, but also offering recommendations on how to resolve things if the parties can't be brought to the table and help to negotiate a settlement. And I suppose the fact that if you've appointed one yourself and you've been involved in the appointment of this board and you've got to know them over the project, that creates a, a, a sort of a, a loyalty and people would be it would be inclined to put those recommendations into effect even without it being binding. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, hopefully these people they have the gravitas, they are people who the parties do respect. And if the the dispute avoidance board says, well, we think you know this is the way forward or we would recommend as this is the solution to the dispute or here's how we think a tribunal may may um, may deal with it, then the parties could think, well, we can go with that or we can ignore that and go right the way through now a formal process and a lot of time and money, but actually come back to the same point in the same place. So, you know, and also another reason by not having it as a binding decision is that when you have a binding decision, you have winners and losers. And that then encourages the parties to maybe hold their cards closer to their chests, not to declare all their issues, all their problems and share them with the dispute avoidance board. And that you may then get, you know, the parties trying to get 
lawyers or experts on their side to try and convince the board that their position is right when actually we want the board not to be bound or constrained by having to comply with even the rules of natural justice you know the idea is that they can maybe offer suggested commercial deals to the parties there's almost no limit to what they can do you know ultimately the parties can ignore what they say if they feel they're going outside of their remit etc but we want the board to be flexible um, so they can have conversations they can recommend ways forward that are going to try and help the parties resolve it it's very much a means to an end yeah, working yeah. with the parties to avoid the disputes rather than picking a side and picking a winner when a dispute occurs mm. The, the DAV it seems to be uh, provoking a lot of interest. I'm seeing a lot of questions uh, arising on the DAV. There's a couple of others on senior reps, but I mean, there's some concern about the cost uh, of the DAV uh, and, and who's going to pay for it. Uh, I mean, that's always one of the issues of, you know, what, you know yeah. why, why should parties agree to this sort of process, which is going to add cost? So, yeah, under the contract, the parties would share the cost of the DAV members equally. Um, the idea being that they are both investing the cost into the DAB to avoid having to spend money on legal advice, experts, arbitrators, uh, whatever, at a later stage. The idea being that, that by investing this money, you will save money in terms of having to go through a formal dispute resolution process. Also, if the parties can stay um, more collaborative through the duration of the contract, more likely to get the right result on time, etc. Yeah, and a lot of these disputes, you know, you, you will have certain, in most projects, you'll have certain disputes of principle that can affect a lot of other disputes, you know, as to how to assess a compensation event, about, you know, design liability, these sorts of threshold points where if you get them, if you get a DAB to make a decision of principle uh, that people can cling on to, you will avoid an awful lot of disputes down the line. And, yeah. and that's it. So the costs really of the DAB are, depending on your project, but could be, could be money well spent. I mean, so there's quite a few questions coming in on this, which we'll come back to towards the end of the session. But just addressing a couple of them very quickly, in terms of the appointment of the DAB members, the idea is if there's a one person DAB, that person is named in the contract data of part one by the client. If there's three, the contractor and the client would name a person each in the contract data of part one and part two yeah. respectively, and they would agree a third at the point the contract is created. And so that's how you would in effect create the DAB and have the members. The DAB can't be selected for use in the UK because it does not comply with the Housing Grants Construction Regeneration Act unless you're not doing work governed by that act. So really this is not a choice you're gonna have very common in the UK for construction work. You've got W2, you have to pick that. Um, the reason why we don't have a W2 and a W3 option to be used together is just additional costs of that. There's nothing stopping the parties creating a separate way uh, within the discussion ladder or having some sort of forum to hear disputes. The idea here is we have a choice of options and you pick one or the other. If you pick two, you start to double up on the same process. Oh, that's right. And, uh, and and one of the questions that comes through is about what happens uh, after the DAB. Um, uh, if, uh, and what happens after the DAB is if is if one side doesn't like it, uh, it goes off to the tribunal. Um, I mean, the tribunal, when we're talking about uh, an AC contract, it's shorthand uh, for, for, for either arbitration or litigation. Uh, and this is where you get a final determination, all of the methods we've been talking about. So, 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 so the W1, W2, W3, in all of those, if either party is dissatisfied with the adjudicator's decision, or if they don't make a decision or the DAB doesn't make a recommendation or no one or someone doesn't like the recommendation, in all of those, your final port of call for this final binding decision is the tribunal. And that's right. And and that you ha you should agree up front, you should agree in, in the contract data, whether it's going to be litigation or whether it's going to be arbitration. Um, just to run through those as options um, in arbitration used to be very common uh, in this country is now less so. Uh, due to the invention of uh, adjudication and the fact that adjudication is now uh, compulsory. Um, nowadays, uh, we more commonly see arbitration in cross-border cases, international cases where you have parties from different countries on uh, complex construction engineering cases where one side won't want to be in the courts of the other side or, or as a purely pragmatic matter, the local courts might not have uh, the expertise uh, or the resources. Here in the UK, we're fortunate to have the, the TCC, the Technology and Construction Court, that has specialist judges who only hear technology and construction cases. Um, 
And so uh, the, the beauties of uh, the beauty of the court is that uh, there's a specialist judge. Uh, you don't pay uh, his wages. Um, there's there's a solid uh, body of precedent, and they rely on, on on previous court cases, and you know exactly what you're going to do. Um, the the downsides possibly um, is that the judgment will be public, so all of your disputes will be known to the whole world, um, and who lost will also be known to the whole world. And and civil procedure is complex, quite strict. There's d disclosure of documents, uh, and it it all it, and it can be quite costly, although the, the courts are now taking steps to, to reduce the cost and, and the impact. Um, the, the other option uh, in terms of uh, the, the tribunal is, is for arbitration, and that has advantages um, of, of more flexible procedures, uh, that it is a confidential process, that's particularly important to a lot of clients. Um, and as with the, uh, as with the DAB uh, option, uh, there are arbitrators that you can pick uh, yourself, so uh, either one arbitrator to be chosen by the two parties, or a panel of three. Typically, one party picks one, another party picks another, and those two arbitrators pick the third. So the the form of tribunal you agree in your contract data, and you have a choice between those two options, uh, which present a very different format, but crucially, both of them produce uh, a final uh, and binding uh, decision. Uh, should either either party be unhappy uh, with any of the the non-binding, non-final uh, solutions in, in the suite of contracts. Okay, I think the last thing we have to touch on before we go through some of the questions we've received is around the dispute resolution services contract. So this is a new contract in the NEC4 suite, but in fairness, it's actually replacing and building upon the adjudicator's contract, which was in NEC3. The reason why we've moved away from an adjudicator's contract to the DRSC is because this contract can be used now to not only appoint an adjudicator, but also a member of a dispute avoidance board. And this contract is designed for use under the NEC contracts, though in fairness, it could be used under any contract, because really it's a contract covering the engagement of a dispute resolver. It covers the basic obligations of that person. It talks about communications and then covers some of the key things around payments in terms of how much they get paid, when they get paid, and then if there's a need, how that contract is terminated or brought to an end. So it covers very much the engagement of the dispute resolver. It doesn't explain what they have to do in terms of resolving the dispute, because what they do in terms of dispute resolution is determined and governed by the contract under which the dispute is occurring. So if it's under the ECC and it's W1, W1 will give you the rules and procedures the adjudicator must follow when undertaking their duties. The same for W3 for a DAB board member. Yeah. Okay, so that's it in terms of the slides we had to cover. We've got a number of questions now, so I'll just start to pick up on, on some of these. Um, there's a question there, is W3 option NEC4 only or available for w, uh, NEC3? Yeah, it is new in NEC4, it wasn't in NEC3. I guess it could be used there, but yes, you would need to do some work around changing uh, maybe some of the clauses, adding Z clauses to give effect to it. Yeah, there's another question there about the, the, the DAB. There's quite a lot of interest in, in the, the identities of, uh, of the individuals, whether they should be from independent uh, third party outfits or whether they can be from the client or contractor organisations. I mean, that's entirely up to the parties. Um, yeah, I think the concept of it is that they should be external, independent entities, but I suppose it is possible to appoint DAB members, senior individuals within uh, the two organisations, again, ideally removed from the project. That, that may, uh, it, it may create more of a dynamic that assists uh, companies in, in complying with those decisions, uh, but equally it may, you know, it may cause a bit of friction with the other side when they decide that a particular DAB member is not independent. So I think the idea is that they should be external, but there's no hard and fast rule. Yeah, I think, yeah, and the recommendation would they should be external to give the, them the sort of the gravitas and the independence for the parties to respect what they're saying to share their problems. If one of the members is maybe from the, the opposition, if you like, if you're in a dispute type situation, then you wouldn't necessarily want to share those problems with that person. It could really, I think, constrain the process. Yeah, and yeah, there's a, there's a question about, again, about DAB decisions and, and the challenge 
to those uh, decisions and, and what the grounds might be to challenge a DAB decision. I mean, uh, I, I've been through that uh, scenario, and in fact, what, what, well, in, in, in fact, one is not really challenging the DAB uh, decision as such. Effectively, when you go, uh, the case I'm thinking of, it went from a DAB to arbitration, but the same thing would happen if you went from a DAB to litigation. You're, you're not really challenging the decision as such, you're just having that dispute afresh. And the tribunal in that case did read the DAB decision, but didn't have much regard to it because it, it knew that the, you know, the DAB's scope was, was relatively limited and they didn't apply necessarily the same tests that the tribunal would. So um, the, the simple answer is that you can challenge a DAB decision under broadly any grounds you like, um, or you may prefer just to hear that dispute afresh without regard to the DAB decision. Okay, another question we've got in, um, someone's highlighting a concern that sometimes people who are working on a project and have disagreements don't want to refer them to senior representatives because it may reflect badly on them not agreeing it at a site level, which I think, you know, it is a, a situation we can all sort of appreciate and may even have experienced. Uh, one thing we do have here, as we outlined in the talk, is that we have this final assessment process. So that would have to drive things to the senior representatives um, if they were being agreed as part of that final assessment stage. Now, okay, that only occurs at the very end of the job, four weeks after the defect certificate. Um, I think in terms of getting things referred more frequently for like as and when disputes actually do occur, that is going to be down to the parties, for example, managing the compensation process effectively, PMA making assessments, contractor enforcing default acceptance of their quotations where the project manager isn't engaging. So. I think there are methods to try and force issues to resolution um, and also maybe some education of the of the teams to make it clear that actually if they can't agree at a site level that's not a bad thing it's part of real life and, le and li lifting up to senior reps is the right way to go better that than having no decision at all um, Question there about the application of the Housing Grants Contributor Rejection Act, how wide does it apply? Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, that is actually not a straightforward question. Um, the, the specific example uh, you raised uh, in the question about whether major highways projects are covered, they certainly are. Um, the, the core here is the concept in that act of uh, construction operations. I'm going to say section 105, but to my shame, that may possibly be wrong. But anyway, there's a section that defines construction operations, long list of what it includes, and there's a list of what it doesn't include. Um, uh, and, and you'd need to look at that in each case. There are some devilishly difficult cases w which involve some construction operations and some which aren't uh, covered by the Act, and then you're really in trouble. Um, and uh, the, the, thing, the thing to be careful about at the outset of a project is, you know, wh which, of my, which of my packages are definitely going to be covered by construction operations, in which case I need an adjudication provision in there, and which of mine aren't, uh, in which case I can do what I like. Um, so that's, that's not a complete answer, but uh, it, it, is, it is a complex question. Um, the answer is in the Act, uh, but not the whole, the whole answer, because there's also case law on, on that concept of construction operations. Okay, um, just get some other questions. Um, and we've spoken around challenges to DAB decisions uh, in the same way an adjudication decision can be challenged. You have that same mechanism and you have to challenge it um, under Clause 53. If you don't agree with it, you can't just let it stand. Uh, otherwise, you get this conclusive cl conclusive agreement occurring through the silence of a party. OK. Um, OK, are there an example of DAB decisions not being agreed by tribunals? Do tribunals normally agree with DAB decisions? Um, well, certainly in terms of NEC4 and the DAB process we have here, that hasn't as yet been challenged through any further tribunal, so it's difficult to answer. Yeah, no. Um, so on other contract forms? On, on other contract forms, um, absolutely anything can happen. Um, I, I have had, I have had d cases where DAB decisions were overturned. This was under the FIDIC uh, suite, but this, the, the tribunals would apply the same uh, freedom of decision. I've, I've had cases where DAB decisions were overturned. Uh, I've had possibly more decisions where the decision was in the same line. But as I said before, uh, quite often the tribunals aren't really looking at the DAB decision line by line and saying, was that the right way to do it? Quite frequently they are 
looking at the dispute afresh, starting from scratch uh, and, and deciding independently. That may, be, that may result in the same decision as the DAB, it, it may not. Okay, there's another question that's coming around timescales for DAB decisions. Um, I think you know, that the, okay, it's important to understand the role of the DAB and how they're meant to operate. So they're appointed from the start, they visit site, when they visit site, they talk to the parties, they try to find out what's going on, and they proactively try and address anything that they think could become disputes. So they can actually proactively identify things that they think the parties need to be aware of and consider a solution to. Or they can deal with matters that I feel like refer to them as part of the, that site meeting process. And also the parties can then, at the end of that process, refer to them things that they want an opinion on. And then there is no sort of, uh, I don't think there's a set time scale within the contract for that. It's more a case of the DAB working with the parties to come up with a, a way forward. And that may be a recommendation of getting an independent third party if, if it's a particular technical decision that they can't themselves give an answer to. So it may be a recommendation on a process to resolve the dispute, or it may be a recommendation on what the answer to the dispute should be. It comes back to it being sort of an inherently flexible process and very much a means to an end, the DAB working with the parties to try to get a mutual agreement. Okay, I think we're running out of time now. There was one final question I will pick up on, uh, which is how would the panel recommend the move from NEC3 to NEC4? Would we recommend it and when to make it? Um, certainly, we are any well, NEC3 will continue on. People are using it. There's some major projects being let under NEC3 now. Frameworks in place. NEC3 has a place and will continue. There's no need to change to NEC4. However, we would recommend people do move towards it. Really, we see it as a natural evolution that NEC4 builds on NEC3, hopefully takes NE3 further forward in terms of new options, clarification, simplifications, and additional content to hopefully make it even more effective and remove some of the common Z clauses that clients may write. However, you know, there is no must change. There's no cutoff date for NEC3. It's when parties, I guess, feel comfortable to make that change. I think you'll naturally when new contracts come up or existing frameworks end. So I think we are unfortunately running out of time. So thank Marcus for his contribution today and thank you for your attendance. And uh, just in terms of future dates for the diary to be aware of, there is another webinar coming up on the 28th of March about enhancing performance through collaboration with Rod Gerob and Simon Vaughan. We then have the NEC Users Group annual, annual Seminar for the UK on the 20th of June 2018, being held at County Hall London. And you can get further details of that and the webinar from the NEC website, neccontract.com. And I'd like to pass on our thanks to Erwin Leighton Paisner for their contribution to this particular seminar and for Marx's contributions. And then finally, for those who aren't aware of it, NEC4 has now introduced a digital library, which is a new format for accessing the NEC4 contracts. And you can get more information on that, again, from the NEC website, neccontract.com forward slash digital library. Okay, so thank you for your attendance today. Hopefully you found it of use. Thank you.